Can you hold it there as long as you can? So, of course, that water is going to get hot, right? Because it's on that plane. Now, now when we're done, when you can't stand it, it's so hot, you can't stand it, you very quickly take that beaker of hot water and you put it here. And you go away, come back the next day, and what do you find? All that heat is gone. Right? That's the second law of thermodynamics. That is a, the, simple, the simplest statement of the second law of thermodynamics. Energy, write it down, are you ready? Energy naturally flows from regions where it is concentrated and gets dispersed out into the universe. That is the second law of thermodynamics. You've seen it almost every day of your life. Again, I'll say it again. Energy naturally flows from regions where it's concentrated and gets dispersed out into the universe. Now, that's what happened with that beaker of water. We held it over that Bunsen burner. That water got real hot. But we come back the next day, and that water's at room temperature. All that, that heat is stored energy. That energy got dispersed out into the universe. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Now, it's even more interesting. How did that heat get dissipated out into the universe? How did it happen? So I'm going to give you a hint. If I ask a question, you don't know the answer. The rest of the semester, if I ask a question, you don't know the answer. Very good chance the answer is the random walk. So, this is the first example. How does that energy get dispersed out into the universe? Random the random walk, exactly. So there's that, let's just say that, um, let's just say that, uh, that Dennis right here is that hot beat right here. And I'm a randomly walking an oxygen molecule in the air here. So I'm randomly walking, and boom, oh, I got hit this way. Ow, oh, I got hit this way by another molecule. Boom, I hit that hot surface. I start vibrating like crazy. I get kicked off with a great velocity. Every time I hit that, every molecule that hits that hot surface carries away a packet of energy with it. And goes in and disperses it out into the universe. So the second law of thermodynamics is something that you've seen your whole life. Hot things get cold. How does that happen? The random walk makes it happen. The random walk assures that that hot beaker is going to get pounded on by oxygen and nitrogen molecules that are at much lower temperature. Every time it pounds into that hot glass, it's like it's getting kicked in the butt. Boom! Shoots out that way, it's vibrating like crazy. Whoa, I'm hot now! But then it gets collided upon by another oxygen or nitrogen molecule, and that heat gets dispersed to that molecule, and pretty soon that heat just dispersed out into the universe. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Now, we can also, so we can say that, we can write this way that, um, Moving faster, they're moving farther, they're vibrating, we're 
increasing the entropy of the universe. So dispersing energy out into the universe. We have a fancy scientific name for that. It's called increasing the entropy of the universe. We're going to come back to entropy in a big deal, big way. By the way, that's the answer. That, so if I ask a question in class and don't know the answer, now I'm going to make it harder. The answer is definitely use a random walk, and if that's not the right answer, then the answer is entropy or entropy change. Just write that down. So we have this thing called the entropy of the universe. And so we can now focus down now with this broad idea and try to focus down into chemistry. And one way to say about any process
Now, and in this chemical subset, spontaneous also has a unique and very important um, meaning in the chemical sense. Spontaneous means product vapor. Ouch! Product vapor. All right, can you dig that? Very important. So I went from this very general definition now to a very specific definition. I want to know. Something we're going to come back to again and again throughout the course of the semester. What makes a reaction product favor? There are some reactions I can write on the board and they don't go that way. It's the reactant favor. We gave the example of water spontaneously splitting itself into hydrogen and oxygen gas. Not a product favor reaction. What is it that makes a reaction product favor? That's a question we're going to return to again and again. We have our first definition as to what it is. We have our first explanation. And that explanation is, it's got to increase the entropy of the universe. For a reaction to be spontaneous, it's got to dissipate energy out into the universe. So, now then we can ask the uh, important question, am I? Am I in agreement with, am I standing here in front of you in agreement with the second law of thermodynamics? Well, you put energy into me, and I convert that energy from one form to another, first law of thermodynamics, and I do all these things, but I'm sitting here at, what is it, the normal temperature, 98.8? 98.6, the song popped on in the 60s called 98.6. I thought that's how I remember it. So I'm standing here at 98.6, unless I got the flu, and the ambient air is at about 75. So I'm dissipating heat out into the universe constantly. I'm way above the ambient temperature. Just like that hot beaker of water we talked about. Oxygen and nitrogen molecules are randomly walking into me and getting a kick every time they bounce off because I'm a lot hotter than, the, than, than they are. They're sitting here at 75. I'm sitting here at almost 100. And so, yes, I am increasing the entropy of the universe. So now, this is very important. I Today, I've accomplished a lot. I let them off go free. That's like a great act of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Kindness. Kindness, I like that. That's the first thing I accomplished. And the second thing I accomplished, I'm increasing the entropy of the universe. For what that's worth, I'm standing here doing it. So we're going to come back to the second law again. I love the second law. I love entropy. I, I, you know, once you clue into entropy, you can see entropy changes all around you. You can see positive entropy changes, you can see negative entropy changes, all over the natural world. It's a lot of fun once you get clued into it. So we're gonna, I'm going to get you clued into it. Okay, now, that gets us to, that gets us to the kernel core concept number six, Mark of life. The spark of life is what I call the chapter, it's our last chapter, chapter 21, isn't it? On electric chemistry. I call that the spark of life. Why? Why is he doing this? To which you reply, the random walk. Why? The random walk. All right, finally.
our living cell. Energy in life, getting it? Constantly. Okay, where is our living cell? I'm on the cell, baby. Oh. There's our living cell. Now, where is There's our living cell. Part two of a living cell. Now, as I said, living, every living cell has a cell membrane. Wonderful, four nanometer thick, four times ten minus nine meters thick. That's well over three orders of magnitude smaller than the diameter of a human hair. In your body, every living cell has that. This, you, you know, we wonder why we crave fat, why fat stuff tastes so good to us. Because when we were running around. In tribes 200,000 years ago, food was scarce. One food we desperately had to have enough of was fat because every living cell in our body has to have fat in, and plus we use it, we burn that for energy. So we have a great taste for fat. That's what the lipid bilayer membrane is. All right, there's a close up picture of the lipid bilayer membrane. And the lipid bilayer membrane consists of a head group. That's what these balls are, the head group, that's an ionic group. In fact, it's what we call a spitter ion. The head group of the lipid bilayer membrane is a spitter ion. We'll come back to this term later. Oh gosh, I'm not going to ask spell this. Spitter ion, German word. S W I T. Spell with a Z. Zitter, that's right. Zitter. Zitter. Yeah, that's good. He may like boom cough. Zitterize. It means it has both positive and negative charge. Bitter ion is any chemical species that has both positive and negative charge. And so that head group there, that ball that you see, is a spitter ion. It has a quaternary ammonium and it has a carboxylate. And then you don't see them very well, but there are these two long fatty chains that point inward. And so that's the thing that surrounds every living cell. And so, of course, that's needed because the chemistry of life is inside, the chemistry of death is outside. So the cell needs this membrane to keep the chemistry of life in and the chemistry of death out. But here's the spark of life. As it turns out, inside, so outside the cell, the extracellular fluid, is an electrolyte solution. What's an electrolyte? Electrolyte is an ionic species. Sodium chloride is an electrolyte. Ammonium nitrate is an electrolyte. So there are electrolyte solutions outside the cell, the extracellular solution, and there are electrolyte solutions inside the cell. Here's what's really, really cool about, about most living cells. The outside of the cell looks something like seawater. It's not quite. Remember our definition of high concentration, 0.6 molar sodium chloride in seawater. Well, the outside of the cell is not quite that concentrated, but, but uh, it, it's um, close. On the inside of the cell, the sodium ion concentration is an order of magnitude lower. That's cool. The cell spends metabolic energy pumping in potassium and pumping out sodium. Why does it do that? And so there it is. There's the opposite. On the outside of the cell, just like in seawater, the potassium ion concentration is much, much lower. On the inside of the cell, the potassium ion concentration
inside of the cell has a little bit of excess negative charge. The outside of the cell has a little bit of excess positive charge. And that is the spark of light. So, a living cell has charge and balance across the cell membrane. If the cell dies, that membrane potential goes away. So what that means is there's a voltage difference across the cell membrane. A voltage difference. Oh, yeah. yeah. So inside is puppet. So I call this the spark of life. The cell goes to great lengths to make this happen. And what it means is there's a voltage difference across the cell membrane called the this charge and balance, the spark of life, means there's a voltage difference across the cell membrane. So, and a voltage difference, very important definition. A volt, as it says up there, what's the fair meaning right? So that means there's a voltage difference across the cell membrane called V-mem. It has units of volts. What's a volt? A volt is a joule. Coulomb. What's a coulomb? By the way, you are responsible for every one of these new terms that I am giving you today. Every one of them. I like to say that learning chemistry is like learning a foreign language. The biggest part of learning a foreign language is vocabulary. I'm giving you the vocabulary of chemistry, at least the vocabulary of this class. So I just made the case that because the outside of the cell has a slight bit of positive charge, and the inside of the cell has a slight bit of excess negative charge, that there's a voltage difference across that cell membrane. What does that mean? Well, a volt is a joule per coulomb, and a coulomb is simply a measure of quantity of electrical charge. Very important. Listen. A coulomb is the charge as a liter is to water as a gram is to mass. Are you with me? So all a coulomb is is a measure of quantity of electrical charge. Coulomb is a measure of quantity of electrical charge. So because there's excess negative positive charge on the outside and excess negative charge, actually it's the opposite, the excess negative charge on the outside, excess positive charge on the inside, there's a voltage difference. It's the, now, what's a joule? Very important for the rest of the semester, you've got to know what a joule is. Because after all, this class is about energy and light. A joule is the basic fundamental work. That's my watch. Basic fundamental workforce tool in, uh, in uh, energy. So joule is quantity of energy. And energy is the ability to do work. So, why is it called the spark of light? Because the cell is storing energy by doing this. By creating this charge and balance, the cell is storing energy. Every living cell in your body is like a battery. So, the, so again, you see a common theme in biology. See, the common theme now developing here in biology, when biological systems want to store energy, the simplest way to do it is to separate charge across a membrane. Very common theme in biology. So what the cell has done here by storing negative charge on the outside, a little bit excess positive charge on the inside, it's storing energy there. And for example, Cell, cell, the cells talk to each other by measuring or discharging that voltage across the cell membrane. So the cell uses that stored energy to do a whole bunch of metabolic processes in the cell. In particular, that stored energy is used for cell-cell communication. So this is the spark of light. And again, I'll return to this point. You know. Great philosophers have debated the issue, what does it mean to be alive, to be dead? What separates?
separates the living from the dead. You know what separates the living from the dead? No. You know what separates the living from the dead? Time. Pretty simple. But what happened 
of the charged surface, and I'm a randomly walking sodium mine, and I go, whoa, I can't resist this. Boom. Negatively charged surface sodium mine. I'm stuck here. I created the spark of light. I created the spark of light, just like in a cell membrane. I got negative, excess negative charge on one side of the interface, just like in a cell membrane, I got excess positive charge on the other side of the interface. And just like in a cell membrane, in so doing, I store energy in that interface. So I can use that energy, for example, the nylon here and all this stuff, a key part of that nylon is made in an electrochemical cell in precisely this way, storing energy at an electric surface and using that energy to make nylon. So there's the spark of light. We electrochemists do this all the time. And just like in the living cell, so we can say charge is usually given a simple Q. So there's excess negative charge, Q metal, that would be just like the outside of the living cell. And there's an equal and opposite quantity of excess positive charge. There it is, Q solution. And they're equal to each other. And we electrochemists call that the electrical double layer. And the electrical double layer is stored energy. How so? So, in chapter 21, we'll discuss how sparking an electrochemical interface this way can be used to help us understand living systems, make batteries for energy storage, and make electrolytic cells for the synthesis of industrial and pharmaceutically important molecules. The spark of life is storing energy by storing charge at an interface. It's done throughout biology, and we smart electrochemists do it too for the same reason, which is to store and utilize Energy. All right. Uh, hey, I, I, I have an idea. I have an idea. Hold on. I have an idea. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere.